Hello, Emory Baptist. Welcome to Sunday School for Sunday, August 2nd. We'll be looking at uh, Session 9 out of Explore the Bible, which is titled Staying Sober. And we'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible today out of the book of Proverbs, verse starting in chapter uh, 23. Uh, when I was growing up, my, one of the television shows that my father would not let me or my brother or my family watch was a TV show called Cheers. And the reason he said that he didn't want us to watch it was because he grew up with an alcoholic father. And so he didn't want us watching television shows that he felt glorified uh, drinking alcohol. And, and so uh, that was one of the things that he was concerned about. But if you think about the television show Cheers, and I've seen it since I've grown up, uh, if you think about the television show Cheers and especially the theme song, the entire calling and the desire of that show, especially if you listen to it, is that you would have a place where you belong, where there's sort of a sense of purpose in being, where everybody knows your name, right? Everyone is looking for that community and for that significance. And it's kind of uh, funny that that show is based in a bar uh, where a lot of times there's a lot of community among people. Uh, but, uh, the, but Solomon here writing in Proverbs, writing to us in chapter 23, his instruction to his son, which is also for us, is that we would not look for uh, life or purpose uh, apart from God and apart from his calling towards us. He says in verse 17, don't let your heart envy sinners. Instead, always fear the Lord, for then you will have a future and your hope will not be dashed. See, believers are supposed to have fear God alone. Uh, they, we're supposed to find our security, to find our hope in him. We're supposed to find our joy in him. And, and Israel's advantage, as Solomon writes from the Old Testament, he's a part of the nation of Israel. And Israel's advantage is that uh, God created them and called them into a special relationship where God, who created all the universe, gives himself to his people and he gives himself a place among his people. And so he calls them into relationship with him. And so that's what you and I have as believers after the New Testament or in the New Testament, is that we have a God who calls us according to relationship. And so the question comes to us, if God knows all things, and that's all things that really happen or all things that could happen or possibly could happen. And if we, know, if we have a God that knows all things and we have a God who says that he loves us completely, do you trust that God to tell you what's best for you? A lot of times we get caught up in envy. We get in that, that idea uh, that the grass is greener on the other side. And we, we, we're standing from our perspective and it seems like somebody over there has it better than we do. Now, the illustration there, the point is a lot of times as you look down into your own yard, you see the worms and the dirt and the, the patchiness and some of the stuff uh, in your own yard. But as you look out across the neighbor's yard, you don't see all those problems. You just see the tops of the grass and the tops of the things that, that look very green. That's the reason that, that you don't see their problems and so their lives look a whole lot better. Well, Solomon writing to this tells us that God's instruction is for our good and for us to desire those things that other people have that are not in relationship with God. Uh, that would actually be destructive to us because God gives us uh, what's best for us. I was talking to a motorcycle mechanic one time who told the story about a man who brought in his son's brand new sport bike motorcycle and it was having problems, the, the engine was really messed up and he couldn't understand why. And, and as the mechanic told him, he said, uh, your, your motorcycle here is, uh, it didn't have oil and it, it kind of got burned up. The motor got burned up and that's what's having problems here. The father said, well, we just bought that thing. And the, motor, the motorcycle mechanic looked at him and said, well, your son here has apparently been riding wheelies and he didn't tell you about it. And the son's face kind of turned red and he began to uh, sheepishly admit that yes, he had been riding wheelies, but that particular sport bike, the problem was when it rode up on one wheel, when it did a wheelie, the oil was, was made to pump on two wheels. It wasn't made to pump with only one wheel on the ground. Uh, and so that's kind of the picture here is that a lot of times when some things look really cool, but they're very destructive to us and for us. And that really brings us to this picture of idolatry. 
Now, idolatry means turning to things that are not God in order to fulfill only what God can do. And only God can fulfill the desires in us for community and for connectedness uh, and to know how God designed us. Proverbs 23, verses 19 and through 21, talk about the petition. Verse 19 says, listen, my son, and be wise. Keep your mind on the right course. Don't associate with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will become poor and grogginess will clothe them in rags. Believers are to associate with those who pursue a godly lifestyle. Um, and the reason is because uh, there, that idolatry that we talked about, that, that there's a, a man named Jerry Bridges who talked about personal hells and functional saviors. It's a common concept. Tim um, Keller talked a lot about this as well. But, but in his book, Mr. Bridges said, functional saviors are sometimes uh, we look for other things to satisfy and to fulfill us and to save us. And these functional saviors can be any object or identity or security and the significance because we hold an idolatrous affection for them in our hearts. They preoccupy our minds and consume our time, resources, they make us feel good and somehow even make us feel righteous. Whether we realize it or not, they control us and we worship them. Um, the idea there is that sometimes we put things in front of, uh, of God or even just not intending to, but we look to certain things, specific things, to save us from the, the problems that we have in life, uh, the, the situations in life that are uncomfortable or that are painful. And so sometimes alcohol can be one of those things and it helps me to forget if I'm having a bad time or helps me uh, forget the situations that are in my life that are difficult or it puts me in a better mood or helps me to feel better, right? Uh, and he also talks about gluttons here that sometimes food has the same addiction, that food um, has a physical addiction that we all need to eat, but sometimes we have this desire to continue to eat. And sometimes it just is this good feeling that you get from eating uh, that sometimes is connected to memory. Uh, Lacey and I used to watch The Biggest Loser TV show when it came on television. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, noticed about The Biggest Loser, or at least that I noticed about The Biggest Loser television show is when one of the contestants would have a breakdown, inevitably they would go to food to find their comfort, to find uh, that, that hope that they had. And it, it doesn't have to be alcohol or food. It could be shopping or video games or television or maybe even work. It could be a, a good thing for you to go to work. But sometimes the idea is that I, I go to work not because it's valuable, but because it makes sense. And it helps me to escape all the other problems of relationship. It helps me to escape all the other stuff in my life that doesn't make sense. And so we tend to gravitate toward people with similar interests. And the danger there is that we hang around those who follow these functional saviors rather than following the Lord Jesus. And so we can easily adopt their ways. And so we need our brothers and sisters in Christ who are children of the same spiritual father uh, to remind us of our connectedness to the Father and our need to go to God for those things, for that purpose for which God created us, to live in relationship with Him. And so when we spend all our time and our energy and our resources pursuing pleasure over the purpose of God, the purpose God has given us, regardless of what it is, uh, it, can, it can leave us poor and confused and worse off than before. And so Solomon writes in verses 29 through 32, this portrait, the portrait of what it means. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has conflicts? Who has complaints? Who has wounds for no reason? Who has red eyes? Those who linger over wine, those who go looking for mixed wine, don't gaze at wine because it is red, because it gleams in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and it stings like a viper. See, the initial allure of intoxicating drinks is re replaced by the abuse and the heartache that often follows. Uh, Foster Brooks was a comedian in the 70s and, uh, who, who made his, uh, <laughs> I guess, career impersonating a drunk. 
Uh, and the, the funny thing about it was Foster Brooks was a struggling actor whose greatest success came from impersonating a drunk at parties or impersonating a drunk uh, for, t for a, an audience there. Uh, but the deal is, he wasn't one of those stumbling, falling down drunks, you know, one of the really, really guys who, who just couldn't hold himself together. He was just one of those guys that maybe had one too many. And so he just kind of mixed up his words every now and then. And so it made him very lovable and very uh, approachable, like he was still a good guy. Um, but the funniest thing about it was during that time, where, during most of the time that he was doing this impersonation, Foster Brooks himself had given up alcohol. He had actually stopped drinking. He used to be a weekend drinker, but uh, he had someone uh, bet him that he couldn't do it. And so he actually had given up alcohol and chosen to continue to live without it. Um, so this description of a drunk that we see in, uh, in Proverbs here, it's less like the beloved Foster Brooks character, right? But it's more like the ones that you would see in other ones that, that, that just are falling all over themselves, that can't function, that, uh, that their lives are falling apart. And it gives those things, those conflicts and, conflicts and the complaints and the red eyes and the mysterious bruises as, as kind of a description of a guy who has lost control of himself because there's these drunken fights or the falling down or, or worse, he's putting himself into conditions and put himself into situations uh, in which he hurts himself or hurts others. Well, alcohol is beginning to, uh, excuse me, is appealing to begin with, uh, but in the end it destroys uh, the life of the drunk. Um, uh, my brother and I have joked for a long time that if you're watching television, you're watching the Super Bowl and they have a a beer ad, typically they show people right at the beginning of the party, right? They don't show people at the end of the party who can't function or crying and uh, who have had far too much to drink. And a lot of times they don't show the person uh, who has ransomed his life uh, in a pursuit of an alcoholism that has addicted him his whole life. Nobody shows that in the commercial. They only show the very first part, right? Um, and so the picture there is, is that Solomon is saying, it looks appealing, but the problem is this escapism, this desire to get away from one's problems, to seek distraction or relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in some uh, other activity to take your mind off of it, it's actually dangerous to us because first of all, alcohol, food, or work, or shopping, or video games, or television, whatever it is, it promises something that it never actually delivers because there is some emotional maturity in dealing with life's problems and in facing, with the, facing the responsibilities that we have. But this is also a spiritual issue too because when we seek to escape, we make ourselves the most important thing. Self-idolatry is the desire to make yourself the object and the focus and the goal of your life and that your happiness is most important at the expense of everything else. The real tragedy is that you are never able to uh, permanently escape. Uh, in fact, uh, the reality comes crushing back to you at the end of that escape, at the end of that time that you uh, have tried to escape and get away, you, you are unable to accomplish those things of giving yourself your own happiness. And so the portrait here that Solomon is describing is not the, the Foster Brooks drunk who's just mostly got it together, but ultimately the guy who comes to the end of, end of himself and finds that he is completely unable uh, to control his own happiness, control his own joy in life, because he has detached himself from God's plan for his life. And in the end, the thing that he thought would bring him joy has actually brought him the most, pa the most pain that he's experienced. And so the unfulfilled promise of this functional savior is that not only can it not save him, it actually entraps him and keeps him uh, locked up and giving him further problems. So Proverbs 23 verses 33 through 35 talk about the problem here. And he says, your eyes will see strange things and you will say absurd things and you will be like someone sleeping out at sea or lying down on top of a ship's mast. They struck me, but I feel no pain. They beat me, but I didn't know it. When will I wake up? I'll look for another drink. 
See, the addiction here leads to the perpetual danger uh, of staying in the addiction. Uh, here's the classic description of a drunk, right? That the drunkenness uh, bends or distorts reality, that they feel more in control than they are, that they have impaired judgment, that they make reckless decisions. But, but, but it's often even compared here uh, in this passage to seasickness. Imagine sleeping in the top of a ship during the middle of a storm. And if, you, if you're prone to seasickness, you can imagine how bad that would be. But even if you're not prone to it, you can imagine it's probably not a, a, a good experience for anyone to be washing back and forth like that. But the biggest problem is it numbs us to the pain uh, of life. That's the problem is this person, even when he's being punched and hit and, and knocked around, nothing can bring him out of his drunken stupor there. He's only driven by his next drink. He's never waking up until he's ready to find that next drink. And so all of his life is falling apart and drinking is the only answer that he seems to find. And, and the picture there uh, is that this sin distorts our perspective of reality. That it makes us feel more in control, but it actually it impairs our judgment. And so you need to draw close to God in relationship to anchor yourself in reality, uh, that there is purpose the way you were designed and escaping it through other things, through other means and, and being around those other people that promise an escape that are not really an escape. All they do is they numb you to your brokenness and, and numbing pain endangers us because pain tells us when we need to change. Um, if you touch a stove or if you uh, stab yourself with something, uh, a lot of times you have this knee-jerk reaction to, to pain that you immediately respond. In fact, one of the ways that you know there's something significantly wrong with you, if, if you're in a car wreck and you seem to have internal bleeding, a lot of times you won't know that until you begin to experience pain in your abdomen somewhere. You begin to feel that pain that tells you there is something not right here. And there is actually a condition called congenital analgesia, uh, which means that you are born unable to feel pain. And the true tragedy of this situation, people who are born with this, is they actually never, most of them never grow up even into ch childhood or even into adulthood, because a lot of times they're so numb to pain that they never learn to stop hurting themselves. And a lot of them cause their own death by just destroying themselves because they cannot feel the danger that's there. They're numb to the pain that's there um, that's supposed to warn them of the danger. And so if you're numb or insensitive to, to sin's brokenness, or if you're numb to God's correction, you are in danger of destroying yourself. And so Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who hurt, is what Jesus is saying, because those who hurt realize there's something broken in themselves. And your hope and your future are dependent on your sensitivity to the Lord. Let me give you a couple questions here to contemplate or discuss with others as you uh, finish up this Sunday School lesson today. Uh, when you face a challenge or a difficulty, to whom or to what do you turn in order to give yourself comfort or to find comfort? Uh, because the question, the answer to that question often reveals uh, what it is that we, that we trust in most. Number two, how do, you, how do the various people in your life help you to pursue godliness? And number three, how can you build relationships that encourage you to pursue godliness? Man, let me pray for us uh, uh, as we kind of close up this Sunday school lesson and uh, as we think about uh, how we can live <clears throat> in response to God's calling on us. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for your grace towards us. Thank you, God, that you are the only hope that we have, but God, that you are a permanent and a lasting hope. And so, Father, help us to find our purpose and joy in you. In your name I pray. Amen. God bless you.